of the panel up here. So we have an esteemed panel group today. We have Guna Kalyanan, who is the Director of Content Acquisition and Programming at Singtel. Uh, we have Craig Dobbs, who is the Head of Programming and Production at Fox Sports. Please, gentlemen, line up over here. Um, we have Olivia Laouche, who is Chairman and CEO of Trace Sports. And we have Andrew Stark, uh, our resident Australian, is CEO of Surfing Australia. And finally, um, and not least, we have Gushi Seti, who is SVP Affiliate Sales and Marketing from Asia Pacific Eurosport. Thanks, guys. Okay, so let's get down to business. So today what we're talking about is we're going to talk about innovation. Okay, that's the key theme. And what I want to hear today is I'd love to hear about where the key innovation points are, where, why does the sport need to innovate, how can the sport innovate. Let me throw the first one out. Let's talk about production. Okay? Let's talk about the actual production of sporting events. Please give me some examples of some innovations that you've seen in a specific sport around production, whether it's a cameras, whether it's something that's happened on the screen, whether it's a graphics. Mm -hmm. um, well, I suppose from my perspective, uh, production is innovating all the time. It doesn't stop. I mean, you've gone from, you know, five, six cameras to 30 plus cameras at cricket. You've got, we've got multiple cameras, multiple feeds. We've got HD, we've got 3D, we've now got 4K or Super HD. Um, we've got sky cams, we've got spider cams, we've got little hovercrafts that go over the top. I, I don't think there's any uh, lack of innovation. Uh, from our point of view, what we have to balance is the cost of innovation and the benefit for the okay. viewer. Okay, you lost me on the spider cam and the hovercraft. What exactly is that? Spider cam goes overhead. It's on your little wires that goes ahead. So you get those shots above a cricket pitch, which look like they're coming from a blimp. It's our cheap version of the blimp. Mm -hmm. um, sky cam was the first derivation of this about 15 years ago. Um, so we put them across the stadiums and we run cameras over the top. The little uh, hover cams or little helicopter cams go, go over the top. They have about a 20 to 30 minute life cycle. They have cameras and we can skim them over the surface and come back. Are they on wires or someone no, remote controls? No, they're just little hover cams. Well, you okay. do have to do it with the approval of the body because okay. there's always a chance they'll fall from the sky and land on someone's head. But okay. we try and avoid that. Okay, d d does the consumer care about that? I mean, do, do, they, do, they do they like those camera angles? Is that bringing the sport to life from your perspective, Craig? Well, I mean, we do it because we think it, it, it adds to the coverage. Yes, we think they do. Does the consumer care how we get the shot? No, not really. Mm -hmm. The consumer just wants to see the content, wants to see the product presented in, a, in an entertaining and innovative style. They don't really care how we do it. I mean, stump cam, when it first came out in cricket, was a massive innovation. It was fantastic because no one had seen that angle before. Now it's just taken for granted. So okay, for the uninitiated, where's the stump camera? Stump camera's on the stump in a cricket game. Uh, uh, actually on the stump. It's part of the stump. It's hollowed out. Okay, how big is the camera? Tiny. Tiny. You've got the stump's not allowed to be any different. We can hollow out the stump and put the camera in. Okay. Fascinating. Where else can cameras go? What else have you seen in your sports? What well, other innovations? Well, interestingly, um, I think um, in 2010, um, there was uh, the, uh, the first time that a simul cam camera was uh, used uh, for rally, where you have um, the cameras put in certain points of a stretch of, of road. Um, where you, you film it, so like let's say three cars going at different times going along that same road, but what you can then do is to superimpose them at, from a certain point that all the cars may have started to come, and then you can see the traction of how they've, you know, which car was racing ahead and which one was a little bit behind with, with markers. So that's one that was used uh, and now is done with three cameras. I actually have a short video if you'd like to, to see I, that. I'd love to see that. The three, um, the simul cam for three cars, please.
Okay, so fascinating. So let's understand that. So basically, what that that was the the film was was overlaid on top of that. So you saw all three drivers、um, at a specific point of time, and you could see in that case how Lebrun looked like he was behind, you know, Lau or whatever. Just、so、basically, you know, sort of the same stretch, so you can see who was driving fast at what point or who、right. was at the、right. similar points. Yeah. What about in surfing? There's got to be something happening in surfing that、uh, some innovation in terms of production. Yeah, I think the big one was the GoPro and and the ability to actually mount that on surfboards and and mount it on the athletes and and、uh, you know it's available to consumers as well. There's a lot of user generated content now coming、um, from the use of GoPro. But in a production sense,、um, you know they've been used on high quality、um, productions and documentaries and and the ability to actually bring the the audience into the wave and feel as though you're actually In the green room, we're in the tube, and 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 experiencing the sport. That's been a very、um, big advantage for us. Yeah. Where does the surfer actually wear the GoPro? Oh, look. There's a few.、Um, they can strap it to their chest. Sometimes the the most common one is actually they've they've got a sponge on the end of the the camera, and they put it in their mouth.、Um, so you see a lot right, of guys、right. sort of they tuck it into their wetsuit or rash vest, and then as they go, they get up, they rip it out, and stick it in their mouth.、Um, There's some amazing footage actually of Kelly Slater doing that, where he puts it in his mouth, and he's so it, it's your direct line of sight、um, through that particular camera, and that one's really popular. And and、uh, and also、um, when they attach them to the board, there's been a couple where they've attached it to the board in such a way that it's underwater, so you can see the flow of water coming off the surfboard, and and yeah, so great innovations, and and certainly improves the the audience experience. Fantastic. Um, is it worth having a quick look,、uh, Nicholas, at uh, uh, Andrew's video? Just give us a, a bit of a, an understanding of what you guys are doing. Yeah, this、oh, this video is、um, actually My Surf TV, which is our new IPTV channel we're launching、uh, later this year in December, and, and it's more around、um, storytelling and, and the backstories and, and around、um, you know weather and, and the, the concept of、um, you know the whole health and coaching and food and fitness and that dynamic of, of our sport. So yeah, have a have a quick look at that. Surfers are part of a global community. They are tech savvy and highly socialised online. Only My Surf TV will cover everything in surfing, all in one place. From the best surfers Australia has to offer to daily surf news, live event coverage, and so much more. This will be the biggest, hottest digital evolution on the surfing planet, created specifically for one major market segment. So grab your brand, drop in, get amped, and don't miss the biggest ride in Australian surfing history. My Surf TV—it's everything Australian surfing has to offer, wherever and whenever you need it. Great, great footage. You know, w- w- when I think of this, and I think、uh, I spend a lot of time、um, thinking about what makes sports relevant, and, and I always come back to. We asked someone asked the question earlier. I think you know, is sports entertainment? And I, I have a perspective on that. I, I think it is 100% entertainment.、Um, I, I think what makes sports so exciting is obviously not just what happens in between the two whistles. But it's the backstories, it's the characters, it's how this you know this one athlete grew up with no money and he had no soccer shoes and he was able to tape his feet together and you know and how he made it to his made it to the pitch or you know everyone has their kind of unique backstory. I think this is something that certainly deserves a lot of attention and innovation. Can any of you comment or talk specifically about、um, things that you guys are doing to sort of innovate the backstory, the game within a game, so to speak? I think that's definitely the, the concept, the format of Tres Sports Stars. So you could have launched、uh, Tres Sports Stars on this、uh, particular, you know, assumption that there is a life outside the, the live game, the, the event itself, a life before, a life after, and it's also about entertainment. It's about lifestyle. It's about、um, you know establishing this very strong emotional connection with the sports people. It's about knowing everything about their life, and、um, and it's also about you know expanding the audience of of sports genre because a female audience will be much more attracted by this type of approach than only by live events. So、uh, when we decided about three three years ago to to launch Tres Sport, it was Tres on that became、um, recently Tres Sport Star. It was really on this assumption that、um, many people did not know that much about the sports celebrities. You know, we could. 
know everything about their, their, their performances, their results, but about their personality, who they are in real life, uh, what about their wife or, or their husband, their kids, their passion outside sports. So we decided to create an entire channel around this format, and this was a major innovation. There are not many innovations um, in this um, environment. So we've got a very short film that will give you more uh, detail about it. Maybe that's Great. also interesting to Let's go to go camera. I mean, let's that. go to tape. You saying? Yelena, Yelena. Natasha, Oscar, Oscar. Jessica. Jessica, Lebron, Kobe, Kobe. Michael, Yao, Tony. Tony, Tiger, Rory, Mark, Rachel, Dan and G, Sebastian, Lewis, Cristiano, Lionel, David, Nima, Rafa, Roger, Maria, Serena, Fidel, Shogun, Kyra, Mike, Byron, Brian, John, Ray, Kelly, Tony, Jibril, Samuel, Novak, Venus, Lucy, Felix. All the stars on one channel. Trey Sports Stars. We love champions. Great to, yeah, great to hear the backstories. Who are the top three celebrity athletes who everyone just has to know about? They have to know what they eat, how they dress. Wow. Um, in fact, uh, Lionel Messi really attracted a lot of attention. You know, when he opened his Facebook page, I think in one day, he had more than 20 million people. Who read. It, it, it's, it's incredible. And, uh, we've got um, a lot of attraction also with some NBA players. Uh, that is really because, you know, the, the trace brand was first about music. And, um, so we've got a big part of our audience which is quite young. So we try to establish also some, uh, uh, you know, connection between this entertaining world of music mm. and this uh, entertaining world of, of the sports people. And in fact, there are a lot of commonalities. There's these, these sports guys like music a lot. So uh, we, we, we learn a lot of things. And, uh, you know, and uh, you, you could see Oscar Pistorius um, and, the, and the teaser. We, we, we spent, in fact, three days in his house a few months before, you know, the, what happened with his uh, girlfriend. So uh, we had at the time a very good, a very close relation with, with, with him. And, um, and it's true that the images that we shoot at the time uh, were used by a lot of other channels after uh, when he was accused of, of, of killing his, his girlfriend. So it's true that we, we managed to get access to these guys. It was not easy at the very beginning, but most of them, we spent you know, days with them. Usain Bolt, we spent three days in Jamaica with him, and he's a very big music fan, a very big mm. football fan. So we, we, we know a lot of things about is, all is that guys. good? I mean, I hate to ask the tough question, but is that good for ratings? Um, it's an awful thing when you think about the news, but when something like that breaks and you've got Pistorius who's accused of killing his... Uh, uh, his wife, girlfriend. I mean, is that what happens? Does that does that bring a sport down overall? I mean, or do, do you find that you know people are more, is there, cur is there the morbid curiosity? Any any thoughts on that? Have you guys seen anything? Um, well, I don't think it's a rating killer. I mean, at the end of the day, if if it's presented in a, in, a, in a factual format in the way it happened, then then there's definitely an interest uh, uh, for for the fans to know uh, uh, what actually happened, so on and so forth. And I think trade sports stars. Uh, uh, to a certain extent achieve that in, in terms of going into homes and, and showing the lifestyles and so on and so forth. And I think it certainly helps uh, these days. I think the fans definitely want to see more than the 90 minutes. Uh, um, and it's a very good complimentary content uh, that can happen either, or you can show it either on TV or on, 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 a, on a companion screen. So what does Singtel do? So you're a typical pay TV player. What do you do outside the 90 minutes? How do you engage your audience? Or, or you just sort of say, you know something, that's not our job. I'll let all the online sites and the Facebooks and the Twitters handle all that. I'll just take care of my, you know, I'll take care of everything that happens in between the whistle blows. Or do you guys take an active participation? Do you innovate around that, the backstory? Um, we traditionally try and innovate actually within the 90 minutes and, of course, beyond the 90 minutes. I mean, uh, one of the things that, that we've done this season with, uh, with the Premier League uh, is, is we've created exclusive content just for our companion app, uh, Mio TV Go. It's not available on TV. It's just, it's just there so that from... Basically, from for two and a half hours, you are actually just seeing uh, all the action that are happening uh, in all the matches, and, and, and we bring in good quality pundits to talk about it. Uh, they talk about their lifestyle. Paul Parker, for example, talks about his experience when he was playing back. So it's about 
diving into the, the, the customer experience or the, the, the pundit's experience and to give our viewers a wider experience in terms of not just watching football but understanding more about what happens behind mm-hmm. uh, the match itself. Mm-hmm. Give me some other examples, maybe from Eurosport or surfing or Fox. You know, what other examples have you talked about? You t- everyone talks about exclusive content, but I really want to understand that because exclusive content doesn't really define what it is. What is it? What is it? It's exclusive. Tell me, give me some specific examples of things that you guys have done in your businesses that highlight what happens off the field. Um, for us, for example, um, exclusive is not just in the broadcast rights, as you said. It's also what you do around it. Um, and with the digital age that we're in right now, where people want more, it's not just what you show on TV, it's what's on um, as a second screen and so on, and in um, mobile apps and so on. So for our US Open coverage this year, we actually, you know, sort of engaged, try to connect with viewers on different uh, points. Um, I've got a video that just sort of caps captures all of this. So this is actually what we did in Europe because we have two channels. So you can see um, how we've actually sort of engaged them on different points. Okay. You can run the US Open um, video. Yep, just coming up. Double up with Eurosport and Eurosport 2 for two court coverage of the US Open. Plus, Eurosport Player offers live coverage from up to six different courts on all your devices. Don't miss any point on the move. Like to tweet? Then follow at Eurosport. And for more up-to-the-minute news and analysis and live scores around the clock, go to yahoo.eurosport.com. Eurosport. All sports. All emotions. Um, what about on the surfing side? Have, what, what, uh, what have you done to cover a backstory or the behind-the-scenes stuff? It seems like that would just be rife. That culture would just be rife with opportunities, you know? Yeah, we've certainly got a lot of characters. And... I think, you know, what MySurf TV is about is those backstories and, and is telling the stories of not just the professional athletes um, that are on tour at the moment because MySurf is not actually live broadcast of the top end world tour events. That The ASP, the Association of Surfing Professionals, um, is run out of America by a private equity group. They'll broadcast the live um, through, a, through a partner. Uh, but we're doing all the, the storytelling of the Australian athletes in their home and, and, you know, really getting down to the basis of their training and, and we train a lot of these athletes through our own high performance centre, so going into, you know, their daily training environments and the sports science research. And, but in terms of um, exclusive, I think one of the really interesting things we're doing, and we've done some market testing already and, and had some incredible traction, is, is delving into the history of the sport and going back sort of 50 years. Um, and we've, we've got our hands on some never seen before footage from famous surfing events in the 50s and 60s and 70s um, that is really compelling um, and then getting some of the stalwart legends from that era to actually tell the stories about that footage and um, we're a whole of life sport so we, we des- yes talk to kids but there's a lot of um, surfers you know in their, in their older years that are really interested in that sort of stuff so some of that footage that's just never seen before and, and surfing as a sport hasn't really been huge in broadcast. It's, it's had a presence, but it hasn't been a big sport in broadcast. Mm-hmm. So the ability to tap into some of that old footage is going to yeah. be amazing. But, but Andrew, just, I'm just really curious about that. that. Um, Nicholas, just one second. Just, just, just put you on the spot. You know, Andrew, uh, Andrew it's, it's a, quite a niche sport, surfing. So you know, in a market like Australia, which is dominated by Foxtel, the, you know, the, the, the big cable operator, I mean, how do you make any progress? You know, surely it's going to be tough to launch this, this channel, right? Well, um, We've done a lot of research in terms of, um, you know, the market there. And, and from a surfing perspective, I mean, I, I actually spoke at the Bright Cove session earlier today about just how competitive Australia is. And there's 48 professional football teams in Australia. Um, compared to California, there's eight, um, you know, similar population, GDP sort of thing. So it is a competitive landscape. But there's... Where Australia is a beach lifestyle culture. Um, you know, 20 million people live near the beach. Um, there's two and a half million recreational surfers, there's seven million um, aspirational surfers, a billion dollar surf retail industry in Australia. So we know the audience is there. Um, the, you know, it's the only sport, there's all those sports like football, cricket, none of them actually support eight um, print magazines. So surfing in Australia has a big audience um, and globally has a big audience as well. So um, it's more around the way we're doing it through this IPTV channel where um, you know, the big sports are dominating in, in the broadcast area, and, but, but ours is, is certainly going to be... And, and, and ours is very much driven around short-form content. 
a lot of two minute, one minute, two minute storytelling that, that sort of you know compels so, audience. So you're delivering that. direct direct to consumers of, over the internet, basically. That's right. Yeah. Um, you know, you touched on something interesting: history. You know, why is history important? I think when you think about European or U.S. sports. I mean, people grow up because their grandfathers watched a team and their fathers' fathers watched a team, and so there's a real heritage, and people generally understand the, you know, the history and the lore of each of their individual, you know, the, the fields they played on, the, you know, the stories, the legends. It seems like in Asia, where they're just being introduced to the sport, I'm not sure, is that true? I mean, you know, how do people really understand the history of Man United or, you know, Tottenham, or do they really understand the Red Sox, or do they truly understand the history of, you know, of... So my question, I guess, is a question from, again, we're talking about innovation, but I think this relates to it, is do we have to be, do we, is it our responsibility to take Asian audiences and give them that background, the core, uh, about some of these, you know, Western sports and provide them with the history or should we just drop them in, parachute them in right into today and forget what, you know, Lionel Messi's and forget what happened to Barca or, you know, AC Milan, you know, 20, 30 years ago? What's your perspective on that? Um, my personal perspective of it is I think... Uh, from an Asian perspective, I don't think they, they, they really want to know. I mean, as much as, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big Manchester United fan, and I became a Manchester United fan because my dad was a Manchester United fan. Um, uh, unless I'm personally interested, but generally, I, I don't think there's an interest across the board about the past. It's all about now, and it's all about the future. Uh, if it's there, I mean, we've, we've, we've put up a lot of information on our second screen, on our interactive TV, with regard to club history and, you know, group past grades and so on and so forth. And factually, it's the least used, uh, uh, which sees the least traffic. Mm. Uh, whereas, you know, everything else that is live um, and, uh, you know, looking ahead sees a whole lot more traffic. But when you talk about history, uh, it sees the least traffic, so much so that we've actually... Stop doing it. Okay, good. Uh, everyone I, I agree do, with, I, I everyone do not agree. With that? You, you know, don't agree. Okay, a little bit go. controversy. Olivia, I, I, I think the Asian audience deserves the best content that is available. And, uh, and I think even, even young people, and you can see it with, with the, uh, the, the, the importance of someone like Michael Jordan for the NBA. You know, this guy used to play basketball a long time ago, but still young people are completely crazy about him. And they know they want to know about everything about him. So I think there are so many you know outlets, so many distribution platforms. If we can propose at the same time the, the newest things, the best, the best you know uh, contemporary um, um, sports live content or uh, behind the scene content plus the history, why not? Okay. I mean, if there is an audience for it, it is well produced. Uh, you know, recently for the uh, ESPN did a series of documentaries. I think uh, uh, two or three years ago for your 30th anniversary or something like that. And the quality of this documentary, where you had a lot of backstories, was was really extraordinary. And, uh, and you had a, a lot of good ratings, a lot of good feedback about it. So I think it's important also to put in a perspective the reality of today, which will not be the same if we didn't have the past. Okay. Yeah, I don't think we're actually saying that that, that we can't, don't make it available. We're just saying that the current audience, the, it's particular in, in Asia, is that they're focusing on the now and the future. I come out of Australia, we have a lot of historical background. We've we, you know, been watching Formula One for years and there is, a, there is a lot of historical knowledge in the average punter. You know, we talk about Monday mornings, we talk sport. There isn't the same history in Asia yet, I mean, and that's more a, an issue for us as well as, uh, as any other people. We have to engage them. We were talking before about behind the scenes. I mean, our biggest problem is, you know, and, and self-interest. We're, trying, we're buying sports, we're putting it to where... We are trying to engage the audience and we're trying to get a bigger audience. To do that, we need to engage them with a hook. And the hook is getting them to know the people that they're watching. And the current people are the ones at the moment that we're trying to say, well, watch this game because that player, he's great. And this is what he did behind the scene. You know, you can watch any soccer game and have 22 nuff nuffs running around the field. Mate, do I care? No. I have to have some reason to watch it, be it the team I follow or the players. Because if I don't know the team and I don't know the players, you're not going to watch it on my channel. So I understand the fact of the history, and I think that's complementary. Yeah. But the person's got to want to look. We can't say, watch this documentary now. He goes, no. Potentially, he may grow into it. If you run a documentary, you know, the history of Manchester, and they're a fan, they may watch it, and they may slowly learn. It's, to me, it's complementary. The first thing we've got to do is get them to be a fan of the current team, the current players, and have some knowledge. And from that knowledge, they can grow. 
Okay, so I, so I agree on that. I mean, it's not in, there is no opposition. I think it's definitely a complementary approach. But uh, I, I, I think this historical background can also bring something to have a better understanding okay. of what is going I th on. I think, I think we're, uh, let's park that one. We may not have perfect agreement. I think all points are taken. I want to turn our attention to scheduling. Um, scheduling, it's so simple, right? It's just a matter, you know, is it, do you move something an hour earlier? Do you, do you delay it? Do you push it an hour, you know, do you push it back? Do you try to optimize it for our audience? There has to be some innovations that are happening in scheduling. It sounds simple, but really it's very complex. When you think about the advertisers, when you think about audience, when you think about the complexity of having most of your broadcasts in the, either the UK or in Spain or in you know, Boston. So can you give me an example of something that you've done, maybe Sati or Guna, or something on your network that's been innovative around scheduling and something that surprised you? Well, look, to be honest, scheduling in sport is... Um Apparently very easy because apparently anyone who watches sport can schedule it for me, which is brilliant. Um, and they certainly let me know how easy it is and really they could be a programmer and an acquisition guy at the same time. Um, sport is, is somewhat simple in regards to you always schedule live whenever you can because that takes all the uncertainty out of it. You're not making a subjective decision. You're not saying to someone, I think you should watch it 7 in the morning or 8 o'clock. You're saying, if you're a fan, you'll watch it live. Yes, we'll do replays or you put it on record. The issue with the scheduling is that we also know that most sports happen on the weekend. So you, what you are trying to do sometimes with sports organisations is convince them to move out of the norm. I mean, in Australia, when I was there in the NRL, we got them to play Monday night football, which was a big thing for the NRL. It was a massive jump. But we said to them, you're going up in the weekend, you're going up against the AFL, you're, going, you're having multiple games at the same time slot. We had to incentivise them and we had to encourage them to play Monday night, and I think since then it's been a great success. Now we, to be honest, we copied, you know, America and we copied, copied the UK. I mean, we're not innovative in that sense, we're fabulous. We just figured out what someone else did and said, I can do that. Um, we did that with the basketball in Australia for a while too. We made them play Wednesday nights. We said, look, you're getting absolutely chewed up on the weekend, you can't play, you're not going to win, nobody's going to watch you, you need to play Wednesday night. So that's, that's the most creative part we can show to other sports. The big ticket sports, I mean, to be honest, you know, the, the BPL, they're not going to listen to me anyhow, and good luck to them. The NFL's not going to listen to me, the Major League Baseball's going to not listen to me, but the smaller sports is where you can be creative and innovative with scheduling, because you can say, mate, if you want a window of opportunity, there it is. What happened on Wednesday nights with that basketball league? Did it end up having an uptick in ratings, or is there any it, kind of... Can it, 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 it did, look, self-interest, we argued that it was good for us, because... The more live sport we want, we would love our channels to have live sport every day across the spectrum, mm. be it a wide range of sports. We think it was innovative and yeah. we think it worked. The problem was the teams argued that um, they weren't too fussed on it. But we, st we still persisted and yeah. as long as we had the rights, yeah. they kept playing. Um, but again, it's, it was the, our argument was, was better for the sport. Because if you keep playing on Friday, Saturday nights, nobody's going to watch watching. you. Sadie, how about you on Eurosport? Well, I am just was about to say, I mean, for sports, I mean, scheduling is a little bit, well, not that sim simple, but really complicated because it is about the live. I think we go back to the value of what uh, sports broadcasting is. Uh, we broadcast over 3,600 first-run programming, of which 80% is live. So we do not have the luxury of just saying schedule it's be innovative in the scheduling. Um, we have to put live when live is because that's what fans want. That's why they come and watch sports. But what I find that the technology, what is uh, um, technology is enabling is when you have those your set-top boxes, your PVRs and so on, where you can start, when you start putting a record on it, um, you can actually go back to, let's say, before the match is finished, a lot of um, pay TV operators are able to have a system in place where you can rewind back, start from the beginning already, uh, before the match is finished, so you don't have to see the results yet, but you can still catch up. So it's a, like a time shift type sort of a scenario that enables you to watch it um, not at the moment it starts, but before the end of the game. I agree with Gushi. I mean, um, what we've seen is live sport aside, uh, even with, with uh, PVRs, uh, the, the trend is to... Appointment viewing is almost a thing of the, uh, thing of the past, right? People want content uh, when they want it. So, so uh, um, what we do uh, quite a bit and we see good success in it is we make content available on demand so that 
that any time you want to watch it, you can come and watch it. And I mean, you don't even have to. We can do remote recording, whatever it is that you want. But but I think live content available on demand uh, for uh, for the customers. I think that's where everyone is moving towards. It's just watching content when you want it. Okay. By the way, audience, if there's any questions on scheduling, I'm going to move forward. We've got a bunch of things to t um, to talk about. If there's anybody on scheduling questions, raise your hand. Otherwise, yeah. we're going to push on. Okay, um, next, uh, equipment. Gosh, you know, I, I'm a tennis fan. I l every year it comes up again and again. Should we shorten the service line? Do we make the racket slightly wider? Should we make the balls heavier? The, you know, the rallies aren't long enough. The, you know, the tennis association goes through its machinations and it ends up just the same. But there have been some exciting innovations, right, in terms of how equipment is managed or in terms of leagues or in terms of the format of the actual matches. Um, 2020, I guess, would be a good example. Um, can you guys think of, give me some examples in kind of your field of expertise or your th where you've seen some innovation um, or you see, you see an opportunity for innovation, whether it's equipment, whether it's the formats. And by the way, audience, if you have any questions, again, raise your hand and we'll find you so you, know, you can jump right in now. We'll try to keep this engaging. Our, uh, our big opportunity in, in surfing is wave pools. Um, and, and obviously, you talk going back to scheduling. Surfing is really hard to schedule because the, the big world tour events, um, there's a 12 or 14 day window and the surfing only runs for six days, uh, which is why trying to get it on free to air television is very difficult and the online side of it has been so big in terms of the audience. Um, and often a, you know, a final of a major world tour event might happen you know, on a Wednesday at 11 o'clock in the morning. That can sometimes be good for an online audience because they're at work and you know, they're watching at work. But, um, the push also to the Olympics for our sport with surfing, I think the only way we're really going to get there is with wave pools and wave pool technology. What's a wave pool? Everyone should know. A wave pool is, I mean, it's basically a, an artificial wave um, that's, that's made. I mean, the, there's three products that are, that are out there and there's a couple of prototypes, but there hasn't been one built yet in the world that is a, a proper, um, you know, four to six foot wave that is of world tour standard. Um, there's certainly a lot of um, opportunity there to do it and there's, um, it's about a $25 million spend. So, um, you know, the, the business model is quite good though, but the, the wave pools really create the ability to schedule and the ability to have a stadium-like experience with our sport. And for us, that's an incredible um, opportunity and, and I think the future will see surfing hit the Olympics through, through that mechanism. Other, other innovations in sports? Anything, uh, Craig, you're excited about? Anything that uh, you've heard, rumoured about how... Well, no, 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 to be honest, I think the, the, the best innovation currently running is what cricket's doing with the third referee. They're using technology to assist the umpires, and I think it, it's making cricket much more compelling. You get the captain has, you know, three picks to challenge a decision, being an LBW. And, you know, for cricket fans, it's, it's quite interesting. So and you for, have to explain that again for the uninitiated. Well, basically, cricket's using technology to double-check the umpires. They, they, they've got tracking technology, which tells you where the ball's going to go. So it's taking some degree of human uncertainty out of it, but they're not allowing the opposing captain or that to challenge the decision all the time. He gets three picks. So there's an element of skill, there's an element of luck, which I think is adding a lot to the cricket, in fairness. Um, it's, not, it's not perfect, because sometimes, you know, television is a harsh mistress. The captain can't make a call. You see it on replay, he realises that he was out, but it, it can't be helped. Um, in the NRL in Australia, they've had third referees for a while, and, and technology helps the viewers... I think a lot appreciate the sport. The problem is, again, it's, it's imperfect. Last weekend in the NRL, you're supposed to have six tackles in a, in a series, and then you change the ball. They, one team scored on the seventh tackle. So technology is great, but unfortunately, if the umpire can't count past six, <laughs> he has a problem. So, um, yeah, these things I think are great to try and help the viewers and the fans and try and attract more fans. Um, you know, let's, let's also talk, I want to talk about kids for a second because, you know, we're, we're all comfortable and we're all kind of the, in the middle age, I'll put myself in that category, middle age guys, we have our habits, we like to sit in front of the TV, we're prepared to watch 90 minutes or 120 minutes of a sport, but the, the honest truth is that's just not the reality. I have uh, my sample size of four kids, none of them watch TV. Um, they're all, you know, two of them are sports fans, but they never watch TV. Um, they're all consuming, you know, in bite-sized pieces. They don't really care when a match starts. It's irrelevant to them. They may dip in and dip out over the course of a match to just sample a few things here and there. And here we are, you know, we're all the plush big executives sitting at the big firms talking about the broadcast rights and how much they're going for. But the kids don't really care. They just don't care. 
Now that's a provocative statement. So, um, so I'll, I'll throw it out there. Challenge me on that one. Is it true? Uh, can we just can we get comfortable and can we say you know something? They'll come around. They'll come around just like that, and they'll start watching it. Or is it actually not true? Do we really have to reinvent how kids are, how how we serve up that sports content? Give me specific examples, specific things you can think about that are going to appeal to kids, or you can just say, sit on our hands, we don't have to do anything, they'll eventually come around. Um, well, I think we all know that kids now um, prefer to uh, consume media through the, digital, through the digital space. So tablets, mobile phones, Xbox, these are the avenues that they're going through. Um, we are um, very proud at Eurosport to be technology agnostic. We buy rights for all, pay, all mediums, not just pay TV, but for mobile, tablets, um, computers, Xbox connected TV. You know, we, we are in that sort of space. Um, and in, in Australia with Foxtel, we've actually launched Eurosport on Xbox 360. Specifically, to, uh, because we identified that the younger demographic were not consuming um, without really, it was hard to get them to the TV space. So the Xbox was an avenue because they were on How the How is that experience different? Give me, what is specifically about the Xbox experience is different? It allows them to also do social media at the same time. They can be watching it, but they can be chatting to their friends at the same time, which is sort of consumed, being in their space of being, you know, with their friends, but also watching and then sharing. So that was a way to get to them. Got it. I, I think we have to... to go into two di different directions. Obviously, the first one is we have to make our sports or sports celebrity content available through so all the platforms that kids will, will use. Or the second thing, we have to work also on the format. So as far as we are concerned, because we are not uh, um, airing you know, live sport events, so we don't have and you cannot cut a 90-minute game and put it into a 20-minute you know, uh, teaser. Uh, but most of the, of the format that we are now developing are really adapted to the kid conceptions, not only on, on the large screen, but also on the second screen, because we understood, as you were saying, that young people don't want to spend that much Olivia, time. give me an example. Give me an example of something that you've done that has resonated with kids, Some, maybe a piece of programming. I, I can tell you now that more than 90% of our content are less than 26 minutes, and more and more are around 13 minutes uh, duration. Sorry, how many minutes? 13. 30. Yeah. So, because that's, that's the reality. They, they, they won't watch more than 13 minutes, uh, you know, most of the content. So, and we, we, we put also much more music than before yeah. um, in, our, um, in our production. Not only music as a background, but uh, we, we, we recently did this very funny show where we organized competition between rappers and uh, you know, uh, football players. So we, we try to get the environment of music, which is extremely important. You know that more than 70% of uh, YouTube concession is about music, music videos. So the, the, the music stars are really their role model. So we, we use this leverage to bring them uh, into sports-related content with the sports people, the sports celebrities that we are covering with three sports stars. So this is one of the directions that we started yeah. to, to analyze. We actually um, we developed a national junior program for on-beach activity um, called Vegemite Surf Groms, which we've had 20,000 kids go through in the last 18 months. But part of that, in terms of engaging them and communicating, we gave all the kids an email, so you know johnny at surfgroms.com, but also we set up a social community where they only had access to it um, and we had to be really careful around um, social responsibility in terms of the kids, they're 5 to 12 year olds and the ability for parents to scrutinise and so on. So, But that community has been a really big take up um, in that. And then from a content perspective, um, we're doing a lot of profiling around young kids, so young kids seeing young kids. So we're doing profiles on these young sponsored surfers that are 10 years old. Um, and following them and following their families. And so it's not always about the Joel Parkinson, Kelly Slater, Steph Gilmore, you know, the top world champions. It's also about who are the up-and-coming kids and what are they doing because they're so, they relate to that age group. So that's, that's really worked for us and it, it continues to work. Okay, let, we've got a few more minutes. I want, uh, let's touch on local for a second. Um, is there something, you know, right in our backyard? Can you guys think of an example of something that's homegrown, that's innovative? Is there a local sport or something that you see emerging on the horizon um, where you think there's potential for innovation, um, you know, right in, the, in, our, in our Southeast Asia kind of region? 
Well, no, look, there are a couple of sports that are certainly trying. I mean, in Thailand, they've developed a Sepak Takraw League, which is their, their local I- individual sport, which is kicking a small rattan ball around by, with their feet, which is <coughs> almost impossible for me to understand. Um, certainly can't imagine me ever doing it. Um, and then you've got Muay Thai, you'd have to argue, in Thailand is now certainly grown in the last 20 years to become an international sport. So they're growing. Uh, when you're saying innovations, I think the Malaysian League, which when they imported you know, the Lions 11 team, I think that was a great move because effectively you had a competitive Singapore team, even though it was a composite, into a competition in Malaysia. And I think that the, you know, that was a really clever move to get Singapore to watch Malaysian soccer. Explain that to the audience, if you Well, would. I mean, effectively, most people know that Singapore has its own national competition, or, sorry, national club competition, and they've entered a team which is uh, the younger players, but it's a composite team called the, the Lions, Singapore Lions, which plays in the Malaysian League, so that you've got, effectively, Singaporeans watching Malaysian soccer. It would be like, all of a sudden, you know, you know, a German team playing in the BPL all of a sudden. You know, it's unfair to, you know, yep. that's a bit simplistic, but the reality is I thought it was a clever move to do. But there are some people that are in, in the region that are being innovative and trying. Um, it's tough because, you know, sport is a very harsh mistress. We, we, you know, we descend on you if you're a failure, and, you know, and we give you no second quarter. Um, it's unfortunate, but that's the nature of the beast we mm, are. Yeah. I mean, th- again, I think that's a great example of innovation. It's a small thing, but by basically co-locating a team up in Malaysia, you're pulling two audiences into one. I, I think mm. that's, that's fantastic. And you're not reinventing the sport. It's still soccer. No, it's Very it's clever. clever. Very clever. Um, okay, so in, in um, Sports Hub, uh, last question. Uh, who's, any of you guys familiar with Sports Hub? Some of you mm. are, right? Is there, can you think of an innovation? You know, we've got this huge infrastructure that's being built a, a couple of miles away. Is there something that we should do, or something that the, if you were advising the Sports Hub uh, contractors or the people who are developing that, that, you know, give me one example or two things that they should do to keep that, to make that facility innovative? It can be anything uh, around technology? I think yesterday, no, yesterday someone said... Um, the place should always make sure it got Wi-Fi. I think that's already a very, Wi-Fi. very, very important point um, because people want to connect with their friends when they're watching. They want to, you know, send photos, text, you know, um, you know, whatever. So I think I would say just make sure there's Wi-Fi. Personally, I think it should be Wi-Fi that's connected to my pay, t- pay TV channel. This is what I'm going for. They can stream us on a second screen. That's what well, I, I think. Like. They should put a wave pool in there. A, wa- a wave pool. Okay, good, good. Um, so, so listen, let me, let me just summarize, and you guys, cut me off if you, um, audience, please think of some questions, because I think we've got one or two questions in the audience. Um, but I'm just going to summarize a few things we covered today. Cut me off if you think I'm wrong. Um, first of all, as we talked about production, we talked about innovation in production, we talked about the spider cameras, we talked about using that little, little, little small camera in the stumps, we talked about innovation around, you know, how we can in- use cameras more effectively on the field and make the audience more uh, engaged in the game. We talked a little bit about graphics as well, innovation. We spent a lot of time on backstory. We talked a lot about time of innovation in the backstory, pulling the stories out, the characters out. We talked. We had a little debate about history and whether history was relevant or not. There was some difference of opinions there, um, but I think we all agreed that it was it's somewhat important. We talked about scheduling, and we talked about and, and Craig, you talked about some innovations around scheduling and how the challenges around you know trying to appeal to both uh, you know the global big global sports, but also being more nimble locally. Um, we talked a little bit about equipment innovation and some of the things, and you were advocating for wave pools and uh, support that. Um, we talked a little bit about younger viewers. What should we do with younger viewers? How do we make it snackable? How do we make it relevant? I think we talked, you mentioned three things. One was keeping it social, right? Um, another one was, what was the other ones? Making it, making sure it's... Um, Short, uh, shorter formats. Yeah, shorter format. And format connected with music. Music. I mean, we've heard music again and again. We talked about F1 and how we bring it to life. Um, and then we closed up a little bit on local sports and try, how to. Uh, when we talked about local sports, we didn't get a huge, you know, yell for all the innovation that's happening here. We got to. So we have to really ask ourselves: Are we truly innovative in Southeast Asia around sports? So, um, last. Any final questions from the audience? We've got a great panel here. Going, going. Okay. Well, listen. Thank you very much. You've been a, you've been a great panel. Thank you.